I was reminded just a few minutes ago uh, that I ever so slightly misspoke, not tremendously so, but in terms of the life groups, yes, if you have questions, would encourage you after the service to go uh, over to Starting Point and ask any questions that you might have, but we put a QR code on this little sheet, and so you can just click right there and find whichever group you are interested in, and you can sign up that way. That would probably be the easiest way, and so, but again, if you have questions, uh, would love the opportunity to chat with you after the service. I think that would be great. I think that'd be really awesome. Uh, This last week, I was working on some projects in the house, uh, which is not uncommon. I enjoy working on house projects, and one of my kids in particular had been bugging me about this project, and the project was to fix the ceiling fan in my kid's room. How many of you are driven crazy by the fan that just goes, anybody? You know what I'm talking about? Drives you nuts, doesn't it? Well, I've installed, I don't know, maybe a half dozen fans in my life. I've done it before. I kind of know how the thing goes. But ever since I put this one in, it's been a problem. And I don't really know why. Like, I kind of know why. But I go up there, and I'm trying to fix it a couple of days ago. And anybody know the, the clip trick? You know what I'm talking about? You get like a clip, and you clip it to the end of one of the blades, and then you turn it on, and you see if it makes it better or if it makes it worse, and then you try clipping it on the next one and the next one and the next one, and in theory, if it's a balancing issue, it should kind of level out. You can add a little weight to one of them, and then it doesn't go crazy. That wasn't the issue. So I'm up there, and I'm trying clip, 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 clip. Doesn't work. So I then try to take off the light fixture portion um, so that I can look at the blades and tighten them and make sure that they're tightened. So I pull that off, and there's a cord that connects it with a little, like, kind of thing, a little plug-in spot, if you will. And I take it off, and I double-check all the blades to make sure they're all tight and they're all tight. Well, then I ask one of my kids to flip on the switch that turns the fan on, and it doesn't work at all. What are we talking about? I got a headache. I got a headache? Oh, yeah. Oh, boy, it was. And it wasn't even because a blade hit me in the head either. It wasn't even that. Although that would have probably also done the trick. So I'm trying to figure this out, and I'm looking, and I tighten all the blades. And I flip on the light, and nothing works. Now, normally, you flip on the switch, and it at least turns on. But I didn't realize the fact that you had to have the light plugged in in order to have power to the fan. So I plug it back in and put it back up and left and did another project and forgot about it. At least until today. Guess what I'm going to do this afternoon? It's a simple point, but an important one. In order for something to work, it has to be powered properly, right? I unplug the thing, and it doesn't work anymore. And that would make sense, because you have to have power to power a fan. That same principle applies all over the place. You want to drive your car somewhere, you're not going to get very far if you don't have any fuel in it, right? You want to heat your house, what do you need? You need electricity to heat your furnace, and then you need natural gas to actually heat your home. If you don't have any fuel, if you don't have the right fuel, you're just simply not going to get very far. Today we're landing this series called Ends of the Earth. And this has been a missional series. What I mean by that is it's all about how it is that we as followers of Jesus are meant to interact with the world around us. It's meant to have a certain level of 
practical applicability. You and I, right, are meant to do something. Our mission at Gateway Church is to follow Jesus and to help others do the same. This series has been about that last part, helping others do the same. Now, through this series, we have focused in on one verse primarily, Acts 1, verse 8, which says, in essence, or the portion of it we've looked at, it says that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And we've explored a lot of different components of what it means to be a witness, but we haven't talked about the fuel yet. You see, even though witness being a witness is not complicated, we'll review that in a few minutes. If you don't have the proper source of power, of fuel, in order to do that, then it's going to be like having a light or a fan that doesn't have any power. It just simply won't work. And so what does that look like? What is it that fuels us to be able to truly be the appropriate ambassadors, witnesses to who Jesus is in the world around us. That's what we're going to talk about today. Lord, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you, Lord, for the really powerful time of worship. I thank you, Lord, for all of the upcoming things that we have going on. I just thank you, God, that you have done again what we could not do on our own. Lord, I ask that this morning as we explore your word, that you would allow what you have to say to come through, that we would hear from you out of your word. And Lord, I pray for all of us that our hearts would be soft to the transformation that you want to cause. I pray, God, that it would not just be something to do, checking off a list. I know it's a holiday weekend and I get that, but Lord, I pray that you would deeply, deeply impact us by what you're about so that we might be proper witnesses in the world for you. We love you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so what we're going to do today is this. I'll tell you what we'll do, and then we'll turn there. We're going to look at the story right around that verse I just told you, that Acts 1a verse, the you'll be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, so on and so forth. We're going to look at the story around it, between Jesus when he ascends into heaven and when the church explodes into what will eventually become the largest faith system in the entire world, billions of believers throughout history. There's something really important that happens right in between there. That's what we're going to look at today. So if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to grab it. We're going to start in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4, and I will read a couple of verses. This first sort of preparatory time we're calling prophecy, and you'll see why that is the case here in just a minute. So Acts 1, verses 4 through 5. You can follow along on the screens behind me if that is your preference. Once when he, this is Jesus, was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Forty days prior, Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. Crazy thing, doesn't happen The power of God working through the Son of God accomplished the greatest miracle that the world has ever seen. But Jesus didn't immediately ascend to heaven at that point. He spent over a month with his closest followers, pouring into them, continuing to teach them. And in our text today, he gives another command, one of his final ones. And he says this, he says, do not leave Jerusalem. At least don't leave until something else happens. Most of his followers were not from Jerusalem. They were from a region about 100 miles north of there. And so this is significant. Don't go home yet. There's something greater on the way. Now, there's a really important principle here, and not one that's primary for what we're talking about today. But there is a really important piece to this idea of waiting on God's timing. It is critical that we wait on the timing of God. 
Now, oftentimes, I'm, I'm a little bit of an impulsive person, you know, like shoot, ready, aim kind of thing. That's just me. Um, you can ask my wife all about that. Um, oftentimes, we don't pace God properly. We either outpace him, we jump before we ought to, we say, hey, I want to, you know, go at it or whatever. Or oftentimes we underpace God in terms of timing. In other words, God's saying, it's time for you to do this. And we say, ah, but I just, I, I really just want to wait. I, I just want to pray some more. Oh, I just want you to tell, can you throw one more sign out there for me? There's this great story in the Old Testament, a guy named Gideon who does that over and over and over and over again. Well, if you do it this way, God, then maybe, you know, and then you can do it this way. The point being, you and I need to be sensitive to the timing of God. It's critical that we do so. Again, not a primary piece of what we're talking about, but certainly an important one. Jesus is telling them something greater is on the way. And we'll talk about what that is now. Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So again, this is familiar territory. If you've been with us over the, Lord, the, the past four weeks, right? let's talk briefly about a witness. What is a witness? A witness is somebody who shares their experiences. This is what I have been through. The image is one of a courtroom setting. You put a witness on the witness stand, and what do they do? All right, let me ask you these questions. Here's what happened to me to the best of my ability to share it with you. Now, is a witness meant to be an expert? No. Jesus does not say you will be my experts. He says, you will be my witnesses. I think part of the reason oftentimes that we are reluctant to share what God has done in our life is we feel like we have to answer every question, right? As if faith and certainty were similar things. By the way, they are not. God only calls us to be witnesses, to be those that would share the truth of what it is that we've experienced. But there's more to it. There's more to it. There's a fuel source here. He says you will receive power. You're going to receive the ability to do so by what means, he says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In other words, here's, this is kind of interesting. This is kind of something I hadn't really quite seen the same way before. For you to share your story properly, and what I mean by your story is what God has done in you, is not actually fully up to you. It's done in partnership with God through the Holy Spirit by the power then that he gives. Now that should comfort us a little bit. I'm not fully responsible. But there also is a little bit of extra like, because it's not my decision to pick timing. It's not my decision to pick words. It's not my decision to say, well, that person probably wouldn't hear it right or wouldn't take it right. It's God's job. It's his power working through those of us that are followers of Jesus. There's a sense of, I then need to be open when the Holy Spirit says it's time, that's the person, this is the circumstance, to be willing to open my mouth. Yes? And so the power to even share our own story comes then from the Holy Spirit working in our lives. I'm going to summarize the rest of chapter 1, and then we'll get to chapter 2. Verses 9 through 26, three things happen. Jesus ascends into heaven. The followers of Jesus then go back to the home that they're staying in in Jerusalem. Again, as I mentioned, this is not where they're from. They're staying on the hospitality of someone else. And they pray. They wait. They obey what it is that God has said. Again, we talked about the critical nature of timing. And then lastly, they replace Judas Iscariot. So Judas was one of the 12 followers of Jesus. He betrays Jesus. He commits suicide. They pray. They discern together with the help of the Lord. And they pick a guy named Matthias to replace. Now we have 12 apostles again. Then we get, though, to this amazing moment. 
The moment when the power, when the fuel really takes hold, which is the igniting of the church, starting in chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this Ability. Okay, wow, this is a lot. So they're in Jerusalem celebrating this holiday known as Pentecost. This is 50 days after the Passover. Jesus was executed the weekend of the Passover. 50 days later, right? It makes sense, appropriate time-wise here. This festival, by the way, and this is significant, is what's called a pilgrimage festival, one of a few. That means that Jews from all over the known world would go into Jerusalem. That's significant in a moment. And as they're sitting there, as they're praying, as they're waiting on God, bang, the world goes crazy. A loud wind shakes the earth, if you will. All of a sudden, these random things appear over people. Like, I don't know if it's like, like a pink regular tongue, like eh, like a tongue that looks like it's on fire, or if it's little flames or whatever, but something weird happens. There's a physical, visible representation of something dramatic that has happened spiritually. And all of a sudden, people who likely only speak a couple of languages... Likely they would have spoken Aramaic as well as some Greek. They start speaking all kinds of different languages. Imagine that. I'm standing up here and I start talking to you in Spanish. Or French or Russian or pick your poison, whatever language you want. And everybody is speaking at the same time in different ways as the Holy Spirit transforms people by indwelling them. It is a crazy moment, a moment of significant change. Supernatural power has come on these people. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Somebody tell me, what is it that the power is for? We talked about it a minute ago. It's one word and it starts with a W. What is it? Somebody tell me. Witness, right? The purpose of the power is for the sake of being a witness. That's important in a second. Verse 5, let's continue to look at what's happening. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem or staying in Jerusalem. You remember I said this Pentecost festival is a pilgrimage festival. So people are in town that don't normally live there, people from vastly different countries. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own languages. And then there's this list, starting in verse 9, of all of these different nations. I'll read them briefly. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia. Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, all the areas around Libya and Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. It's a lot. It's a lot. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about, check this out, the wonderful things God has done. You remember what being a witness is about? About telling what you've seen, what you've experienced? They are saying to us in ways that we can understand, again, supernatural ways, what it is that God has done, and it is amazing. It is amazing. And then they ask a question in verse 12. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. The power of God giving the ability to witness properly. Critical, beautiful, supernatural, all of those things at one time. The church 
has ignited. But there's one more piece. And this is for such a time as this. Verse 13. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. Of course, there's going to be people who are perplexed, but interested, curious, you know, blown away by what's happening. And then there's going to be the doubters, you know, the critics. Ah, they're just wasted, it's fine. Then we have this beautiful moment, again, the power of witness happening through who earlier in the story would be one of the most unlikely to do it. Let me talk for a brief second about the Apostle Peter. Peter is everything that me as an impulsive guy is. I so resonate with this guy. If you know anything about his story throughout Scripture, he is a speak-before-you-think kind of guy. He gets himself over and over and over into trouble. And sometimes he has these great highs. He was the first of the apostles to say that Jesus was the Messiah. And literally, immediately after, he tries to hold Jesus back and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. He's the guy that said, I want to walk out on the water towards you, Jesus. And he steps out and then he realizes it's a storm and is like, oh boy, this was a mistake. And he sinks. And yet look at what happens when the power of the Holy Spirit uses this very broken, messed up vessel of God. Let me summarize for you, verses 14 through through 35. Peter starts by saying, nope, they're not drunk. In fact, this is what was predicted by the prophet Amos. Now, Amos lived about 800 years prior, give or take. In the book of Amos, or excuse me, uh, well, yeah, here he quotes it, but in the book of Amos, there's this interesting conversation where Amos tells about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in verse 18 of our text, it says, in those days I will pour out my spirit. And then at the end, in verse 21, he says, why? So that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Again, the Spirit empowering people that their hearts might be transformed. Peter then goes on to say that God endorsed Jesus, but that you, along with the Gentiles, were the ones that killed him. God released him from death. He raised him from death. And then verse 36, so let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Bold words in a weird setting after the Holy Spirit comes on Peter as well as his other friends and things change. Things change because God's the one that does the changing. If we try to do it in our own power, we will fail. If you're a follower of Jesus and you're trying in your own strength, even if your motivation might seem right, What really motivates you if you try to do something on your own? Eh? Maybe a little little pride in there? A little hubris? Ah, I can can convince so-and-so. First word of that sentence being I, of course. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, amazing things can happen. Check out what happens here. I'm going to read 37 to 41. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and each of them said, To him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, for your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. In other words, become a Christian. The term wasn't used yet, but become a follower of Jesus. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging his followers, save yourself from this crooked generation. Verse 41, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day. Check this out, around 3,000 in all. This started as a group of 120 people. Now, 
We have one service today. We have more people in this room than what has been common for us through the summer. I'm really glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Normally, normally, we have about 120 people in this room at our 9 and at our 11 o'clock service. Normally about 120. Again, a few more today. This room right now, look around, has around 300 places to sit, including chairs and high-top tables. In one sermon, one sermon, Peter takes a normal Sunday and multiplies this room by 10 if every seat was taken. Talk about a preacher's dream. Un believable gospel impact. Was it because he did it on his own? Somebody tell me. Sorry, that wasn't me. Was that me? Sorry. I didn't hear you. What did you say? Was it because of him? Oh, there we go. Who was it because of? Somebody tell me. The Holy Spirit? Oh, that's right. Good answers. So here's what's happened. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit's coming. Wait, be patient. The followers of Jesus do that. They are patient, they pray, they wait for what it is God wants them to do. When the timing is right, the power of God initiates it in a weird way in this setting. Not always is it in a weird way, it certainly was here, I think sometimes it still is. The Holy Spirit comes on these people. And then when the time is right, Peter willingly stands up, walks through the story, and people's lives are transformed. So as we land this series, the question that I have for you, well, I have a couple. First of all, are you in your life seeking to be a witness? I think that's a really important first question. For many of us as Christ followers, we live this very like, internally driven, I'm just going to kind of do my thing, I like church because it makes me feel good, or, or, or you know, I love the Lord, but, but I'm so nervous, and I'm so scared, and this and that and the other, and my life is so much about my own comfort, I'm speaking to myself, I want you to understand this, that it's pretty much just going to stay here. That my following of God is going to be in this room and nowhere else. And so the first really important question, the one we've tried to ask, the one that we've tried to, through this series, show the deep level of importance of is, will you be a witness? And I know that that can be scary. I know that that can be off-putting. I know that that's going to make you perhaps look bad in front of someone. Choose this day whom you will serve. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for my house... We will serve the Lord. That's what this guy named Joshua says, and he is like a man's man from the Old Testament. Choose today whom you will serve. Are you going to serve God? Are you going to be a witness? If you're not yet following Jesus, that is not for you. I understand that's weird, that's wacky, but if you are a follower of Christ, I hope that question cuts you a little. I, you know, I'm not trying to hurt you, but I just, I hope it hits you. Will you be a witness? What does that mean? Well, I think that leads to a second piece, which is will you allow the Holy Spirit then to guide you? I talked earlier about our tendencies, particularly our tendencies as they relate to being a little too quick, you know, outpacing God or sometimes underpacing God. And if I'm honest, especially in this area of being a witness, I think most all of us underpace God. In other words, God might have someone, God might have a circumstance or a situation. Someone might ask you a question and it sparks something in you. And that still small voice of the Lord hits you a little bit. And instead of properly saying, all right, Lord, how then should I bear witness to who you are? How then, Lord, should I 
pray, talk, ask questions, tell my own story, we just kind of go off and do our own thing. I have had, to my shame, so many times where that's happened to me. Where, to be clear, I know that God is saying, this is the time. Speak up. And I don't do it. And I might not be the only one in the room. But I've had those times. And so the question is, am I going to be willing not only to be a witness, but then to listen intently to the Holy Spirit to know when that time is recognizing that it might be costly, recognizing that I might be looked down upon, but recognizing that that is literally your vocation if you're a follower of Christ. Your job is not to be a plumber or an electrician or a salesman or a CEO or whatever, graphic designer, videographer. Your job is not that. It's not to build houses, not to do greenhouse work. It's not to do any of that. Your job, first and foremost, if you're a follower of Jesus, is to help others do the same. And it's in the Bible. And the way that it says is, go therefore and make disciples. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses to your family, to your children, to your spouse that is not yet a follower of Jesus, to your neighbors who don't know Christ. You will be that person. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're sitting in this room because somebody said it to you. I know I'm getting fiery, but I'm not going to apologize for it. Because you and I are the only Jesus that most people will ever know. The only one. And so, yeah, let it sting and then do something about it. This is a missional series. It's not just about learning, although I hope you learn. It's about doing something. So will you be a witness? And then will you let the Holy Spirit guide you? The most important part of your story and mine, and all of ours that are followers of Jesus, is that God sent his son, who lived a perfect life, died a death on your behalf and on my behalf, so that we might know God. That's known as the gospel. It's known as the good news. Today, as we end our time, we're going to end it in this beautiful tradition known as communion. Communion is not magic. It's not mysticism. It is this incredible moment where we as followers of Jesus, take the bread and drink the cup together, remembering what it is that God has done for us. A couple things about communion. One, you do not have to be a member of Gateway Church in order to take communion with us. If you have said yes to Jesus, if you've professed faith in him, then we want to encourage you to take communion the cup, and to take the bread with us. But if you're in a place yet, regardless of where you attend church, where you're just not so sure, we would ask that you take this time to contemplate, to chew, to think, to pray, recognizing that this is meaningful, deeply meaningful to those of us who are followers of Jesus. But if you're not in that place, it's not really going to necessarily mean the same thing to you. What I'll do is I'll invite you forward. We have elements on the left and the right-hand side here. You can grab them, go back to your seat, and then we'll take communion together. Let me pray, and then I'll dismiss you. Lord, thank you for the gift that we could never repay. Thank you, God, 
for the salvation that you have provided through Jesus, through his sacrifice, that we, God, might have life again. We are unworthy of that unbelievable gift. We acknowledge that as a group in one voice. We declare that we need you, God, and you have not failed us. As we enter into this time of communion, I pray that our hearts would be stirred toward what you've done. And I pray that we would remember you with joy. In Jesus' name, amen.